Some of you would. We're going to go, you turn to Revelation 17, we won't be there for a minute, but we're going to do some reviewing and I'll put a new bullet point out as we've been studying things to come. So, things to come takeaways. First and foremost, the study of things to come challenges us to live holy lives. You see this, uh, the verses up there that say that. We are not studying for just information's sake. We are studying to understand the times that God has put us in so that we can be effective and relevant. That's a big word that, that churches use this day. That the church be relevant. The Word of God is relevant. In fact, it's more up to date than the Mars newspaper. Paper. It's in this book what's going to happen. And we're going to look at what's going to happen and tell you ahead of time. You won't have to wait for the newspaper. God's got it here. We're going to be looking at those things. But the whole point is that you might live a holy life walking with the Lord now, realizing that this world's passing away. Going on. The rapture and the second coming are two different events. When people study end time things, they have a tendency to take verses that are all about the second coming and apply them to, okay, is this, say, the rapture is getting ready to take place? Or is there even a rapture? Or vice versa. Uh, they take rapture verses and apply it to the second coming and there's a lot of confusion. You need to keep in your mind there are two different events and there's some scriptures about that. Now we focused so far, we haven't really focused on the rapture. Uh, we've been talking about the second coming. The signs for the second coming only apply when Israel is a nation. We looked at Matthew 24, a lot of the, the verses. But the second coming is when Jesus Christ bodily will set His foot on the Mount of Olives. The mountain is going to split in two and He's going to march through the eastern gate which the Muslims have closed up and planted, put all types of graves in the way so He couldn't do it and that's another subject explaining that. But He'll march into that eastern gate and He'll begin the Millennial Kingdom. That's the second coming. But there are things that are going to be happening right before that that uh, are uh, there, but they only apply when it is a nation. The issue of wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in divers places and the pestilence and the kingdom, and all these things that we've looked at so far only apply when it was a nation. And we know from 70 A.D. up to 1948, Israel did not exist as a nation. There were Jews scattered out through all the world according to the Old Testament warnings and prophecies that if you don't get right with God, He's going to scatter you. And they didn't get right with God. And guess what? They got, got scattered and ceased to be a nation. But He also promised that there would be a time He would bring them back to the land and birth the nation again. The dry bones would live again. And we... Some of you were alive when it happened. I was alive shortly after it happened, 10 years later. But you've seen the rebirth and this prophecy come to pass. And so the clock is ticking now on the signs that are going to happen. Go on. The seven years tribulation is the biggest ballpark of signs that are going to come right before uh, Jesus Christ comes in the second coming. We looked at the book of Daniel, and there is exactly going to be exactly seven years of things, of signs that are going to be happening. And at the day, the last day of that seven years, the day Jesus Christ is coming back and the second coming will happen. The signing of a seven year peace treaty marks the beginning of the tribulation. Uh, I won't go back into that, but you can look at uh, that in Daniel chapter 9. We looked at Matthew 24, 4 through 44, and Revelation 6, chapter 6, through all the way through chapter 16. Talk about most of the signs that are in this seven years tribulation. We looked at some of the things. The fresh water, one third of it being destroyed by an asteroid. One third of, um, yeah, that's the, we'll look at the four horses of the apocalypse and the different things that are happening. Uh, God gives an overview tied into the Antichrist, which we're going to talk about starting today. Uh, an overview of the Antichrist and what his reign will be like. In the four horses of the apocalypse, we'll get to the rise of false prophet. Okay. Go back to the other one. If okay. You 
My bad. Four horses of the apocalypse. He'll come in uh, as a man of peace on a white horse. And he will say, I'm, I want to bring the world together and, and us to create a, a global community and be one world of peace. But the second horse of the apocalypse is a red one, and a great sword will be given to him to take peace from the earth. I personally believe the UN will empower this man, the Antichrist, to um, do away with national laws, and he can go over any boundaries and not worry about national law, only uh, international things, and go root out cell groups wherever they're found throughout the world. And there's going to be a, a lot of fighting because, as we know, there are uh, radical religion cell groups, but he's also going to root out, um, try to root out Christians. The third one is a, is a pale horse, which is pestilence and sickness, and a black horse, which is death. Um, then uh, some of the other signs, great earthquakes, which, by the way, we just heard one, and in a lot of different places. An asteroid is going to hit, and uh, there's going to be a third of the vegetation on Earth burned. One third of the sea creatures is going to be an asteroid that hits there that, that causes that one third of the people, uh, creatures in the sea will die, and it will pollute as blood one third of the sea. Another one will hit the fresh water and will pollute one third of it. And the one third being repeated is a slap in the face to the angels that rebelled against God and became demons. One third of the angels fell and rebelled against God. And so these physical things are to fly in the face of these demons who have tried to get worship. How many of you know that people worship trees? And in and, and, and nature. I mean, you know that. Wiccan religion, a lot of other, way, uh, other things like that. Um, the stars and different things. So there we are. One third of the luminaries, the, one third of the, the stars will be darkened. Uh, increase in demonic activity. We talked about uh, the transhuman movement and the, the things that are going on with that and how that will be demonically empowered to try to create a new brand of humanity that will be genetically made where they will not have a sense of right and wrong. They'll try to genetically get morality out of them so that they can be more uh, controlled by the demonic activity. And we talk about that, so keep going. The next one we, we talked about for the last two weeks is the rise of the false prophet. Uh, the false prophet will, will be clearly seen before you'll be able to clearly identify the Antichrist. And we looked at the, those, uh, we're going to go back to Revelation chapter 17. Um, a world, uh, he leads a worldwide ecumenical movement to combine all religions to worship the beast. He will be a religious leader. It's an ancient religion that has just continued to have different forms and things. And they, and let me say this, when we talked about the particulars of, of the Catholic Church, all denominations, this is all denominations that do not uh, embrace the truth of God's Word and the saving gospel. The only reason I talked about the Catholic Church from uh, Revelation 17 is because the false prophet from all indications will be the head of the Catholic Church. From all indications would be, the, be a pope. So uh, the false prophet will lead the worldwide ecumenical movements of saying, hey, it doesn't matter what you believe, just respect. How many of you seen the, the bumper sticker, sticker that says, coexist? That's that. That's what's being preached and taught and trying to pervade on not only us but throughout the world and by the fact that they're saying that people who are committed to their religion being the right one is the problem in the world. And so they'll try to get rid of it. Today, um, that's, that's the end of the bullet points, we're going to begin looking at uh, the Antichrist. But in the same way that in identifying the man, the false prophet, in identifying the man, the Antichrist, you've got to look at the organization that he will lead. And so we're going to look 
in Revelation 17, verse 3. We're going to look at the organization that He leads. Verse 3, it says this, So He carried me away in the Spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a scarlet woman, a woman sitting upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So we know that the false religion and the false prophet is going to be dominant over this political entity called the beast. It's a political entity because the scarlet woman is a religious entity. And so to understand who and what this beast is, uh, go to verse 8, chapter 17. Verse 8. It says, The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. When they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. Does that sound like a riddle to you? <laughs> it does. And... To understand it, you have to do what we did with the organization that was the false church. You have to go back to its roots in history. So if you would, turn to Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Let me get there myself. You would think I would put bookmarks, but we're going to be in a couple of different places maybe. Daniel chapter 2, I could look up there, so maybe that's exactly what I'll do. It says, Daniel is, is captive in the land of Babylon, and God allows King Nebuchadnezzar to have a vision of a statue, and nobody there can interpret it. And so, by God's grace, Daniel is able to interpret what this image is. But what this image is, it is the list of every world empire from now till Jesus Christ reigns in the millennial kingdom. And I, I'm about to show it to you. It says, uh, the image, this, is, this great image whose brightness was excellent stood before them and the form thereof was awesome. The image's head was of fine gold. Its breast and its arms were of silver. Its belly and its thighs were of brass. Its legs were of iron. And its feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till a stone that was cut out of hands, which smote the image upon its feet that were made of iron and clay, and broke them to pieces. Then was the iron and the clay and the brass and the silver and the gold broken to pieces together and became like dust, like the chaff of the summer of threshing floor. And the wind carried them away, and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is a dream, and we will tell you the interpretation thereof before the king. All right, before I go into the interpretation, did you get what was said? There's an image. The head's gold, and then you've got silver in, in the breast and arms, and then the, the stomach part was brass, the iron legs, and then the ten little toes on the feet were iron and clay mixed. A big old rock, a mountain made without hands, rolls down, hits the image, it crumbles into dust or chaff, and the wind blows it away. And then the rock that does this becomes a main, great mountain and fills the whole earth. God has just given you every kingdom that will exist until the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords reigns on this earth. And I'll show you. It says so right here. You, king, O King, are the head of, uh, our king, are a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given you a kingdom, power, strength, glory, wheresoever the children of men dwell, and beasts of the field, and fowls of the heavens hath he given into your hands, and hath made thee ruler over them. Thou art this head of gold. That's the Babylonian kingdom. We know that. So we can stick a pin for certain. Babylonian kingdom is the first kingdom. Now let's see what the next one is because the gold didn't continue throughout the statue. There is a different metal which indicates a different kingdom. And after you shall rise another kingdom. It says it right there, plain English. 
inferior to you. In other words, not as glorious and, and, and wonderful. Uh, shall come after you another kingdom, and an, a third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. The fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks into pieces. Before you leave that, go back to the, the other one if you would. Notice the third kingdom encompasses the whole earth. And when we talk about these kingdoms, who they are, because from history we know. Okay, now go to the, uh, the next one. All things. And as irons break, uh, that breaketh all these, it shall break into pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of strength of iron, for as much as thou saw the iron mixed with the miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the, shall the kingdom shall be partly strong, partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with the miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now, let's stop right there so we can use history. We know from a stick pin point the Babylonian kingdom is the first kingdom. Then it went to the arms of silver. It said another kingdom's coming. From your history, do you know what the next kingdom that, that pervaded most of the civilized world, not all of it, but most of the civilized world at that time? The Medo Persian, which is a united Medo. Persian. There were two entities that had joined together to create this kingdom, the Medo-Persian Empire, which, once again, most of the civilized world, it was the dominant world power. From there, we go to a little guy named Alexander the Great. Do you know what Alexander the Great did when he fought his last battle? He went out and cried because there were no more kingdoms to conquer. He had conquered every rebel kingdom in the world and he, in one sense, ruled the world. Shortly thereafter, he died from drinking, I mean, he was drunk, vomited up, and choked to death on his own vomit. But, for a time, he thought he was king of the world. He had conquered the whole world. And, as Scripture prophesied, this would happen. Third kingdom. Fourth kingdom, if you know your history, after the Greek Empire came the Romans, and one of the things that uh, typified the Roman Empire was their implements of iron that they used. And as we know, the Roman Empire. And notice two legs. Um, what happened with the Roman Empire? It grew so big that it split into two parts. There was that which was headed by Rome, and then Constantinople was the the capital of the eastern part of the empire. But it was two parts. Now, if you believe the Word of God, there's only one part of this left. The toes. Now, what do we know about uh, the, the, the Roman Empire and, and, and that type of uh, dynamic? When it fell, it fell to the hordes and, of uh, um, Europe and um, it broke apart. Now, under a guy named Charlemagne, he tried to reassemble the empire of Rome. It was called the Holy Roman Empire. Charlemagne, if you know your history. He tried, but he couldn't keep it together. And what has been happening, if you know your history, from, from then till up to the present time? These little toes have been fighting one another. Some have been strong, some have been weak, but still the remnants of the Roman Empire. Now does that fit? Revelation 17 said this kingdom was, and then it wasn't, but it still is. They, in my lifetime, 1991, how many remember, well you don't have to raise your hand, you might be telling the age, the formation of the EU, which says, we're, we're one people, we're one group, and we'll start working together economically to make us a unit, and we'll try to work to the point where we can politically work together and be a unit. 
The reason that hasn't worked is because you've got some strong nations economically and other, and then you've got some that are defaulting on their national debt and they're trying to be propped up by the air. You've seen it in your lifetime. Some strong, some weak. And they can't quite put it together to rebirth this last form of a world empire. But the ten toes are in existence right now. But one of the things we're going to see as we move forward is that these ten toes are going to be uh, what the Antichrist does in trying to put them back together into a world dominant power. And we're going to probably not get to today, we may get to the sum of it talking about what's going to happen in the future politically that, that, that this is going to happen. But these kingdoms have, are already in existence and are operating. I want you to see, though, the good part, the hallelujah part. And this may be where I spend the rest of my time at. It says, the kingdom should be left to other people. But it shall be broke into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Who is this rock not made with hands? Jesus Christ. The millennial kingdom. Jesus is coming back. There's not going to be another world empire that's going to dominate. What is in existence now, the Antichrist will try to put together so he can gain power, and that is going to seemingly happen during part of the seven years tribulation, the first three and a half years. He's going to look successful, and after that it unravels. But we're in this time, people, and right after that, Jesus Christ, the second coming, is going to step foot on this earth. And we that know him as Savior are going to rule and reign with him. What time are you living in? You're living in the last days, my brother and my sister. It isn't a time to be lukewarm. It isn't a time to coast. This world is about to go under. How many of you would book your next cruise with a Titanic as it's going down? You say, you know, this was a nice ship when it, it was doing good, and though there's some problems with it, I think I'll book a cruise for next year. Only an idiot would. In fact, if you know anything about the Titanic, jewels and all types of expensive stuff went down with the ship. Why? Because when you understand you're on the brink of eternity, you know what matters and what has no value. May God wake us up to know what has value and what has no value. Because the rock is coming and it's going to crush the rebellion of this world and it's going to set everything straight. And so, this is the beast that, that is talked about in Revelation 17 that this Antichrist is going to try to reform. So we are going to go real quick to Revelation 13 because it gives us some more details about this uh, Antichrist kingdom that the Antichrist will uh, take, will be behind the scenes to help it happen under demonic empowerment and wisdom and then in a certain time will step up and become the man. Revelation Chapter 13, starting at verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Now you've got to understand symbolically that the sea in Revelation usually means the sea of humanity. You've heard that phrase used? The sea of humanity? Well, this beast rising up out of the sea is the sea of humanity. There is going to become a organization, a group. Once again, we're not yet to the individual man antichrist. We're seeing the rise of the political tool he will use to gain power. The beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon the ten horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads 
the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and his authority. I want to stop at verse 2 and actually work my way back from the end of the verse. The dragon represents Lucifer, Satan, spiritual head of the evil empire, so to speak. Notice what he does. He gives his power and his seat. What did the scripture say that Satan is? He's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that ruleth in this world. Now, let me give you some good news. He's a squat. He has power because man is bound by sin. And even Christians that are no longer in the sense bound by sin, they're forgiven, they walk in sin and therefore aren't blessable. And that's why Satan rules. That's why Satan's ruling in America. Because we who have the power and authority do not walk in the power and authority that we have been given in Christ. We don't stand up for this book. We don't preach this book. We don't live this book. This book has become meaningless platitudes to the millennial generation. You know why? They haven't seen the reality of it. They've only seen the hypocrisy of it. And they say, I don't want anything to do with organized religion because it makes me sick. Hey, if that's you, join the club. It makes God sick too. I can show you in Revelation chapter 3. Lukewarm Christianity makes God vomit. You know what? We're so used to being sick, we don't even know we're sick. We think this is normal. And it's not. But anyway, Satan is the prince of power in this air. He has authority unless we invoke the greater authority of the one who has taken the title deed back. And you can see that in Revelation chapter 5 if you want to look at that one. And anyway, Revelation is a unfolding of that. And great authority. Let me say this. Do you want to stop the direction the world is headed? Then you need to stop the authority and power and seat that Satan holds. Did you let, let that sink in? If you want to stop the world from unraveling, if you want to bring America back to Christ, it is about stopping Satan's power and his authority. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We have promises. We have all we need in Christ. Jesus said it before he sent us out on the Great Commission. He said, all the power, all authority is given unto me. You go therefore, preach the gospel, make disciples all over the world. And I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, we're coming toward that end of the age. He's coming back to say, no longer are you the ones that I'm going to work through. I'm bodily coming back. And so when my Lord comes and I have to give an account, I don't want to be that unjust steward. I don't want to be that steward that was asleep. I don't want to be that steward that buried my talents in the ground. I want to invest. I want to invest in the future kingdom. That's the only one worth putting time and energy and money and resources and effort in is the future kingdom. Why? Because that rock grows into a great mountain that will abide forever. That's the only one that's not going down. I told people when I visited Israel, I said, I'm an American. And I love America, but this is my homeland. There'll be a time where America is no more, but Israel and Jerusalem will stand. That's the kingdom that I live for. That's the kingdom that I fight for. And I fight for America because America was founded on those same principles that God had with the Jewish people. But great authority and power was given to Satan. I'll finish up verse Two, and we probably today won't get to seven heads and ten horns and talk about them. But backtracking, it says, he had, um, was like a leopard, like a bear, and the mouth is the mouth of a lion.
Turn if you would real quick. Daniel chapter 6. Scripture explains Scripture. I'm okay of re you reading Dr. So-and-so's book about the end time. Or listening to some speaker talk about the end time. But if they have anything accurate to say, it will be found in this book, explaining this book, because God explains it to those who will look to see what He has to say on the subject. Now, remember this kingdom that we saw in Revelation 13, bear, leopard, lion. Alright, we're going to look at this vision. Um, verse 1 we'll read real quick because I don't want to take too, too long. Uh, and the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and a vision of his head upon his bed. Uh, then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel spoke and said, I saw in my vision by night, a, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove against the great sea. In other words, Four winds talk about the four corners of the earth and it's talking about encompassing all people. So whatever is happening will encompass all people. And verse 3, And four great beasts came up from the sea different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand upon his feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. Verse 5, And behold, another beast, second beast of the two, was likened to a bear, and raised itself up on one side, and had three ribs in its mouth and in its teeth, and they said to thus, Arise, devour much flesh. Verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of its four wings of a fowl, and the beast had also four heads, and dominion was given unto it. And then, after this, I saw in the night vision and beheld a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, exceedingly strong, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured broken pieces, stamped the residue of, uh, with the feed, and it was diverse from all the beasts that had come before it, and it had ten horns. And then there'll be some more things that we'll look at next time. What this is, is... These beasts represent the same thing that the statue represented. Different kingdoms. In fact, particulars I could go into of history that happened in these different kingdoms is described. This, these are historical connections I can make, not predicting future. But, in this, what it's telling you is this. The kingdom that the Antichrist is going to put together will be over the territories of these other kingdoms of what they also control. And so there's, there's some connection of the area that the Antichrist will try to pull together uh, into its kingdom and its political influence. And the truth is this. If you want to look at the best representation currently, form, it would be the, uh, the UN. Now, UN doesn't have any power at this point, but represents nations all over the world. And so, when we look back in um, Revelation 13 at this beast that was like a, a lion, was like a leopard, was like a bear, he's referencing territories angelic, demonic, demonic spirits that are, were over these kingdoms and that they're going to try to pull together. The demonic part is going to try to pull together the physical world people and territory parts and in some type of satanic, let's all be friends, let's pull our resources together and let's defy the God of heaven. Now, in spiritual realms, if you study the occult and things like that, that type thing is being purported already. See, angels are all on the side of Jesus Christ, but demons, it's sort of like the reality show survivor. I'll buddy up and partner up with you, but sooner or later I'm going to knife you in the back because I'm going to be the last man standing. So these demons that have been over these world powers that have, have come to power, they want world domination. They still want to win the game. And they're willing to 
Lucifer's been working it all along. He said, listen, if you'll give me their power and influence so we can make those human beings work together, we can reestablish battle. The political and the religious and the economic, and we can rule the world again. We can make this dream of, of Babylon happen. And so, in the spirit world, that's what they're trying to do. And one of the reasons they hate America so and has been working so to tear it down is because we've been an independent nation. And we've also since, especially since World War II, we've been the, the superpower of the world. We don't need to cooperate with anybody. We don't need to come into one big kumbaya, let's all get together and work together. And Satan has, during my lifetime, been trying to tear down the distinctive and uniqueness of the United States that God built in it to His glory. And they're trying to dismantle it so we will, we will kowtow to the rest of the world and go along with whatever they want. I will tell you this. If I was President of the United States and there was a righteous war, I wouldn't ask the UN for permission. I may do it from the standpoint of saying, listen, we're going to get involved in this righteous war. just want you to know. But I don't need their permission. And yet, our country is being <coughs> herded to let go of what God has given us as a heritage. And after all, you should just enter the family and nations of the world and be just quit being that bully big brother and just go along with everything else everybody wants. How they spend their money, where they spend them. I mean, I could get into a really big political discussion about what's going on in our world that fulfills this, but unless you are aware of it, you'd probably get lost in it all. I don't have the time. But these forces are at work in our world right now, and the only thing that's going to stop them is the spiritual power of the blood of Jesus Christ in the Son. If you don't know Him as Savior, this scary world coming, choose the right side. I want you to know Jesus Christ wins in the end, which means I win. We come out on top. And so, why would you back a losing horse? Don't spend your money on a horse that you want to lose. Come to Christ. And if you know Him as Savior, be aware of what time you're in, of what's important and what's not. Let's pray. Oh God.